right, everyone, I hear the church bells ringing from across the street. It is the top of the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Natalie Armstrong Moton, and I welcome you from the bottom of my heart and soul to another uh, Will Work for Food presentation. This is the New Possibilities Hour, and every week, co-moderators Jeff Kitchaven, Jean Lawler, myself, and Sari Agamiri invite you to join us for a fantastic presentation by a member of our industry, uh, litigation, mediation, arbitration. We provide hour-long programs every Thursday morning, 8 a.m. East Coast, 11 a.m. And if you are uh, a repeat uh, attendee, you know that we don't charge for these programs. Instead, we hope that you find them valuable enough to make a donation to a food bank. Hopefully the food bank that our speaker has a preference for, but if you have a food bank that's near and dear to you and your community, please consider making a donation to your preferred food bank. That's the whole idea behind We'll Work for Food. We provide the work and we hope that you can make a donation of any size. Well, today I want to say hello and invite to our We'll Work for Food platform our special guest, Dr. Diana Williams. Dr. Williams is, among other things, just a really, really good human. And I'm going to read to you her short bio. Um, and I have to, I'm sorry, look away from the camera to read this. I can't make eye contact with you because this is one of those bios that is so rich in education and experience. I want to be sure that I get it right. Um, Dr. Williams brings a wide range of international conflict-related training experience. She has a strong background in the Caribbean and Latin America, in particular around criminology, conflict resolution, mediation, restorative practices, restorative justice, and cultural competency. In her previous life, she was a criminologist and a consultant and has done coursework at a little school that Jeff loves, Harvard, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government at the International Institute for Restorative Practices, as well as the National Defense University's William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, where she, where she is a rostered adjunct instructor. She is a clinically certified criminal justice specialist, a certified sentence mitigation specialist, a certified social and behavioral research investigator and a certified mediator. She's a licensed trainer of trainers in restorative practices, a crime prevention through community engagement and a crime prevention through environmental design specialist. Dr. Williams has numerous publications and is very impressively uh, a co-author of the 2012 United Nations Human Development Report for Trinidad and Tobago. And so we're going to invite Dr. Williams to give her presentation to us today. But before I do that, I'd like to say welcome back from holiday to Jean Lawler and ask her to give us the total that we know about in donations made to food banks worldwide. Thank you, Natalie. You know, it's always great to go and there's no place like home though, right? It's always great to get home. So it's nice to be here again today. Thank you. Well, our number is amazing. What you've done in two, the two weeks that I've been gone, uh, the total as of today is $283,604.15, as in one five cents. That means we only need $16,400 to get over the $300,000 mark. That's just Amazing. I, I can see a half a million dollars coming up closely here. <laughs> really impressive. Listen, everybody, thank you so much for your support. Um, I'll turn the floor over now to Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, do you have a food bank that you would hope that we support? And if not, I'll let you continue on to describe the food bank or move on with your, your program. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am honored to be here and I encourage everyone to donate to the food bank of their choice. Uh, it would have been easier to select one pre-COVID, but uh, because of the international need, I just encourage everyone to donate to the food bank of their choice. And thank you so much. 
Um, so I, I sound great on paper, but a lot of what you heard is born out of frustration. I come out of academia and I was, I took early retirement because I was so upset with academia. I felt that it was all about publish or perish and getting tenure. And, and I felt we were doing nothing for the actual people, the community, the country, the world. I felt we should have been the think, think tank. And when there's a problem, we get together across the seas and we solve it. I know that's idealistic, but that's why I went into higher ed. So I started working in the communities. I became a mediator. Then I became a restorative practitioner. And I started donating my time to communities uh, to help them solve conflict because conflict unaddressed erupted into some type of violent manifestation. So, um, so I just wanted to give you a backdrop as to why I chose this path. As a restorative practitioner, I found that it was so impactful that I started using restorative processes in my mediations and also using some dialogue. Uh, so it was a hybrid or holistic approach to mediation. I found it to have more long-term permanent as opposed to short-term temporary results. And I differentiate that because if we address the conflict, it's the symptom of a deeper problem. So if we only address the conflict, our solution will be temporary because we have not touched on the underlying cause of the conflict, which is what restorative um, practices does. And for the purpose of this webinar, I want to differ differentiate between restorative practices and restorative justice. You will hear them used interchangeably. Um, for me, restorative practices is a lifestyle. You live restoratively. Um, when I train folks on how to live restoratively, how to facilitate circles, how to facilitate conferences, um, we always start off with some introspection, reflection, um, some peeling of the onion. Because you are taught to use uh, restorative processes and restorative language in your everyday life. Hence the reason I say restorative practices is the lifestyle and restorative justice is how we, the folks who are living this lifestyle, have determined we want to deal with wrongdoers. Offenders are restoratively referred to as wrongdoers or the folks, the person who caused the harm. So I want to, I want to actually read you the official definition of what is restorative justice, and I'm going to interject um, my challenge to the process. Restorative justice is voluntary, it's facilitated, it's a supported process that allows, that creates a safe space, that was me interjecting, to allow for contact between someone who has been harmed and someone who has caused the harm. Both parties must consent to participate. Um, so here is me again. The courts should not force the wrongdoer to participate. Both parties can withdraw at any time. Um, neither party must be offered an incentive to participate. And here I go. The courts should not say, participate in this to avoid jail time whether it's said out uh, implicitly or explicitly. The person who has done the harm has to acknowledge the harm and take responsibility for the harm for the restorative process to proceed. So it's not just the court saying, I'm sending you to a restorative conference um, as part of the court process. There must be some acknowledgement. The needs of the person harmed um, are the, at the center of the process. And here is me again. But the needs of the person who caused the harm are as important as, if sometimes not more important than the needs of the person who has been harmed. And this, that's what we're going to talk about. 
So the needs of the person harm set the pace. They can choose their facilitator. They can stop the process, process at any time. Um, and in preparation for a restorative process, there is a pre-interview process where as a restorative facilitator, I actually interview the person who caused the harm, who has admitted, expressed remorse, and is willing to participate, and the person who has been harmed. Then I ask, is there anyone that you want to support you, which would be their communities of care? And if they say my friend, my aunt, my cousin, my grandmother, then we invite those and then we interview those people. So it's a community decision making process. It's long, but it is worth it if it's done properly. It is not a quick fix. It involves many steps including suitability risk assessment, because not everyone should or could participate, emotional preparatory work, and aftercare support. Um, because if it's identified in the process that someone in the process needs some type of intervention, anger management, um, counseling, whatever, then that has to be part of the aftercare process. It is not an alternative to the criminal justice system. In fact, it must work in tandem with the criminal justice system. That was me. It is not compulsory. It is not about apologies or forgiveness, although these things may happen. It is not mediation where parties enter as equals. In mediation, you have two parties who disagree about something. In a restorative process, one party has hurt or harmed another. Um, the entire process is based on acknowledging that one person was harmed and the other person caused the harm. Um, contact can take many forms, such as face-to-face -face meetings, facilitated letter writing, um, facilitated family listening circles in which the person who directly caused the harm may not even be involved, um, but where the consequences of the harm have had a wider impact on family dynamics and communication that the person who has caused the harm wants to address. And I want you to remember that a statement about family dynamics, because I'm going to talk a bit about concentric circles and the family will be the immediate circle outside of the, the, um, the one in which visually the person who caused the harm or the person who has been harmed stands. So, um, so I argue that it is as important to heal the wrongdoer as it is to heal the victim, um, especially if we want to reduce recidivism. Um, because the role of the correctional system is to protect society against crime, but also to correct the people who come through the system. And our system is not doing a good job of correcting the wrongdoer. It's also not doing a good job of satisfying the victim, which is how restorative practices was conceptualized because the victims do not typically have a say. But in focusing on the victim, we've not focused on the wrongdoer. And I argue that if the victim is to have um, closure, then the wrongdoer must also be attended to. So I envision it as the crime is committed, the wrongdoing is done, uh, the wrongdoer is assessed for any criminogenic needs anger management, drug addiction, you name it. Because if we don't, and we just house them temporarily in prison, when they come out, whatever the issue is still exists. And they're more likely to reoffend. That, that's the basis of my argument. Um, now, there are some folks who are already cocking the triggers of their gun to say, Psychopaths and sociopaths can easily cry and pretend that they are remorseful and, and then we, we're gonna shift them into this restorative process. And, and that's, that's a fair statement. 
but popular science has shown this. Uh, so there's an, there's an option to go to prison or to go the restorative way. And uh, someone who is um, well-versed pretends and goes through the restorative process, at the end of which there should be a contract. For me, when the court refers it to me, I have to have a contract signed and send it back to the court to say these parties have agreed on whatever it is. So they agreed to do whatever for the next one year. Popular science has shown if they get over so quickly, they never make the year because now they're cocky. Oh, I got over. So after about, science says six weeks, they start slacking off. So if it was to, I don't know, paint somebody's house or sweep somebody's yard, whatever it is, after a while, recognizing that they actually got over, they start slipping and they never finish. They never meet the terms of the agreement. And the, the final paragraph says, failure to will result in it being referred back to the court. So there is a, there is a process that allows for referral back to the court if they do not meet the terms of the agreement. So it's, it's complicated in some ways and it's also long and drawn out, but, but here's why I think it's important to acknowledge it. If we just lock them up and throw away the key, uh, then what have we really done? And I checked this week, our recidivism rate is 43% within three years and 70%, that's almost three out of every four ex-offenders reoffense and is re-arrested within five years. Then we're defeating the purpose. The correctional system is not correcting and the criminal justice system is not protecting. So we need to find another way. Now, some people argue, why should we spend all this time and effort on these wrongdoers? Um, here's what's the driving force for me. I, I've been trying to remember where I was and what school I was in of the many schools, but I was forced to read an article. And I say forced because I wasn't in the mood, but I had to read it. And somewhere in that article, there was mention of less than 5% of babies are born bad seed, which means more than 95% of babies are born good, which means if they turn bad, whose fault is that? Is that? That's our fault. Us as the society that created the dysfunction that these kids are forced to grow up in, and I use the word forced because they didn't ask us to come into this world. We brought them in for a whole host of reasons, which will be a whole other webinar. And so we have created the dysfunctional environment that they're growing up in, we all oh, these kids, their heads are always in a in a phone. Well, they didn't create the phone. They're always in front of the TV. They didn't create the TV. And the parents have a responsibility to create the TV time. We, the parents, are buying the phones for them at younger and younger ages. So I say that to say um, we have to accept some responsibility. So I was training some prosecutors in a particular country. They were all young, whooper snappers, and they were the hardest people to get to understand. They were using a nine-year-old. He's now 15. He was nine and he robbed someone. They put him on probation and then he raped someone at 15. And I said, you just put him on probation. Did you have him assessed? What do you mean assessed? Well, what was wrong that made him rob in the first place? That's not our, that's not our issue. Um, we were just looking at how to move him through the process. I said, well, if there was an issue that caused him to rob the person in the first place that remained unaddressed, then let's say, for example, he was living in an abusive home and you released him and sent him back there, then what did you expect? 
And so, oh, but these kids are so bad, I said, so you're saying that they were born bad. Well, no, we're not saying that. Well, then if they were, weren't born bad, then how did they become bad? And that's kind of the path I had to take with these, I call them whoopersnappers because they were bright, to get them to see we have some responsibility for what these kids are doing. And I love to pick on the kids because these kids then become the adults that we just don't want to have any sympathy for because they're grown but they started off as kids living in some type of traumatic situation, except for the 4% that according to whatever that article is, was born bad. So, so my argument is when they come into contact with the law, they need to be assessed, both the victim and the wrongdoer. And then if it's determined that the wrongdoer, the victim is really the easy part because that's what restorative practices focuses on. Um, there's a protocol for dealing with them. They need to be heard, they need to be assessed, and their needs need to be addressed. But nobody talks about the wrongdoer. So I'm arguing when the wrongdoer comes into contact with the law, they need to be assessed. What com comorbidities do they have? Is it a drug problem? Is it a, what's their living condition? Especially the juveniles, but also look at the adults. Um, are they homeless? Are they suffering from PTSD? Whatever it is, they need to be addressed. And then a recommendation has to be made for whatever their needs are, biopsychosocial needs, to be met. Even quite apart from participating in the restorative process, and I'll use domestic violence, which is something nobody likes to talk about as an example. So the police officers receive a service called domestic issue, and eventually they move the woman and the children. How has that helped? The, the abuser, uh, the wrongdoer, is probably, and I'm speaking, I'm actually gonna use the much hated bell curve. I'm speaking about the majority, but there are extremes. The wrongdoer is probably after a while going to seek out a female with the personality that suits his proclivity. You've just cleared the path for him to bring in another potential victim. And that's the problem there. Now, I would also argue, and I'm going to tread carefully here, that the victim, the, the person who has been harmed, also has to be assessed because by and large, from a psychological perspective, there's a certain personality type that will probably seek out another abusive partner. So that person, if it's low self-esteem, whatever it is, also has to be assessed and also needs some type of counseling. But, but let's talk about the wrongdoer. So you cannot then just pull the two of them into a victim offender mediation because there is a, still a power imbalance. So she's still afraid of him. If you bring them into the same room without addressing both of their needs, then adopting a neutral stance as the mediator actually fosters the imbalance. So we have to be very cautious. So I recommend, although I'm finding a lot of countries don't particularly want to use it for domestic violence, let him, I'm saying him, although there, there's an increasing number of hers, let him be assessed and be counseled whatever he needs. Let her be assessed and the kids and whatever their needs are addressed before you even contemplate bringing them together. Just to make sure that the playing field is a little more balanced. So one of the reasons that it's important to also 
address the needs of the wrongdoer is so that the person who has been harmed has some closure. Um, the, she's walking away knowing that he's abusive. She will forever be afraid of him. But if his deeds are addressed, she, let's say she knew he was an alcoholic and he drank because, whatever it is. If she knows that he's also getting counseling, she's more likely to think, wow, finally somebody's addressing his needs. So he's less likely to be this angry, whatever it is. As opposed to you just move them, she's always going to be afraid of him. So I want to go back a bit to touch on our responsibility. I've, I've put it in a way um, that I want you to visualize. I say that we have the primary victim, we have the secondary victim, and we have tertiary victims. The primary victim is the actual victim. Secondary could be the families who have been impacted by this person's hurt. And then tertiary would be maybe the community, the school, the church. Um, I argue that there are also primary, secondary, and tertiary wrongdoers. And that tertiary would probably be us. Because unless this kid or this person was born bad, then it's the family's dysfunction, which is probably a trickle down from the community's dysfunction, probably a trickle down from society's dysfunction that trickled inward just to create the dysfunction and environment that that child or that person has to exist in. So I consider us to be, well, there are primary wrongdoers, secondary, tertiary wrongdoers, and we're probably in the tertiary quadrant, meaning society. So we must take some responsibility for it. If we don't, then it becomes a them and us. These kids are just bad until one of our kids does something. So and that's probably, that has been the driving force for me. And that's why I say that it has to be a discursive process. There's a lot of back and forth, talking, assessment, reflection. And I also caution folks who are interested in engaging in restorative processes. You have to have a very strong uh, awareness of self. You have to be aware of when your experiences are coloring your perceptions of the people you're serving, your reactions to people. I was in a, um, a meeting last week um, and they were talking about the, sh the, the school shootings and everybody was so broken up. And so we had to check in. Um, check-in circle, restorative check-in circle. Where are you today? And I had to say, and everybody was so broken up, and I had to say, I need to explain something before I respond. It has taken me years to, to compartmentalize my life. So while I'm broken up over what just happened, if the rest of my life is going well, I cannot let that bleed over and color the rest of my life. So I acknowledge and I'm broken up over it. But to say I'm coming in at a zero because of what happened is unfair to the rest of my life that's going well. But to be able to acknowledge that there has to be a level of self-awareness, you have to be checking in with yourself constantly, talking to yourself constantly, not necessarily out loud because folks will think you're crazy, but constantly chatting with yourself. So why am I reacting like this? When I turned into the second half of the century, I was with my mother for a few weeks in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm walking down the hallway one morning. She would get up and she would make me breakfast and pack me something every morning while I was doing a consultancy there. She didn't have to, but she did. And I'm walking down the long hallway one morning and halfway down I realize I'm irritated, ostensibly with her. And I stopped, why are you irritated? And I'm going through this in my head. Why are you irritated with this senior citizen who gets out her bed every morning to make you breakfast? What's the issue going on here? And then I'm 
rewinding it in my head and I, you know what it was? I had begun menopause <laughs> and I was having a mood swing. And I had to go back and go, oh, this started when I got that hot flash as I was walking out. My, ah, okay. Rewind. And then I go into the kitchen. I hug her. Thank you. But I was heading down that hallway really like, ooh, like, mm. So, but I've gotten in the practice of checking myself because I cannot take it out on the people around me. My daughter tells me when she was nine, um, she came home from school one day. And when she came in and she said, hi, mom, I was like, mm. And she said to me, this is what she's telling me. She said, I tell you what, I'm going to go back out that door and I'm going to knock for you to open it. And whatever it is that has you upset, I need you to realize it has nothing to do with me. How about we do that? And I was like, no wonder you give me so much lip now. You started at nine. And she went back out and I had to rewind, rethink. And I thank her for that. But that you have to be able to reflect, otherwise you cannot do this work. And you also have to engage in constant self-care because otherwise you'll take everybody's issues with you. Now I promised that I was going to pause and ask if there were any questions because I really want the dialogue rather than just me talking. Does anyone want to shoot me? You're welcome to do that. Just tell me why so that I can justify why I need to duck. Any questions? If anyone, if anyone, thank you so much, Diane. That's a lot to think about. And if anybody does have any questions, we have a, a crowd today of moderate size. And if, I think people can just feel comfortable unmuting themselves or putting a, and speaking out loud if they wish or putting a question, type it into the chat and we'll be happy to read it out loud for them. Well, while, while, while we're waiting for that, Diane, let me ask you a question. Of course, we've had terrible mass violence in the country over the last few weeks at the supermarket in Buffalo, the church in Orange County, the school in Texas just last week. And uh, some Not of the, yesterday, I think. Yeah. So, so perpetrators, uh, some of them have been killed in police response to those, but the uh, not sometimes you get people, uh, perpetrators who survive attacks like that. And uh, what, what do you say about the restorative justice process when it comes to people who have committed evil acts on such a heinous scale? So one of the reasons I, I use that 4%, 4 96% is because Restorative justice does not replace the criminal justice system. It works in tandem with it. So there are some people who are going to have to be handled accordingly. However, my scientific mind likes to dig deeper rather than just make an assumption that they're part of the 4%. And I'll give you an example. I was contracted to assess a home for children with behavioral issues in a particular country. There were 35 boys. It was a boy's home. There were 35 boys. When I was done, I did a report and I said, these nine boys are suicidal. There is some inappropriate behavior going on here um, that needs to be addressed immediately, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to use the inappropriate behavior. I'm just going to use drinking tap water to be politically correct. So one boy killed another boy and they locked him up. He was 18 at the time. Tried him as an adult, he's on death row, um, fighting to become a lifer, to be given life without parole. My argument was if the cause of the murder, and I'm not saying he shouldn't be treated by the system how we should be treating. I'm saying if the cause of the murder was the tap water, there are 34, Four, well, 33, because he killed one. 33 more potential murderers in that boy's home. Is my math correct? So therefore, regardless of how the system decides to treat him, and in some cases, he's going to have to be treated the way he's treated. 
Um, but to avoid an issue with the other 33, that tap water system, I'm trying to be correct here, needs to be replaced. But we tend to say, especially if you're one of the 4%, lock you up, throw away the key and not look at what caused it. Looking at what caused it does not negate the fact that in, in the case of heinous crimes, the system is just going to have to do what the system does. But for 96% of the people, and if you think of the criminal justice, the, the cake model, most of the cases are nonviolent. That's wasting the court's time. And a lot of the cases specific to juveniles have underlying issues that need to be addressed. Um, you can't just put them on probation and send them back. And I'm reminded of a case where they called me in, uh, one 18 year old stabbed another and he was put on probation because it was a flesh wound and it was his first offense. And I did my restorative thing with the person who was harmed, the person who, was har who did the harm and the mothers, they were best friends. So I needed to get a sense of what was going on. When I asked the person who did the harm, one of the restorative questions is what were you thinking at the time? Not why you did it. What was going through your head at the time? His best friend was teasing him using words that the four guys who bully him every morning and take his lunch use. And he asked him to stop and he kept saying those words over and over. He said he just lost it. So I asked the police officers, were you aware that he was being bullied um, in the morning? That's not our problem. We didn't have to ask that. I said, well, if this is to work and if you don't want to see him come back and, you, and this time the knife not miss, you need to ride the bus with him in the morning. And they did. And they accosted the bullies. Um, and so I say that to say restorative justice does not replace the current system. My argument though is if we capture some people at the, mo at the moment of their first wrongdoing, then they're less likely to reoffend. Having said that, if we practice restorative practices on a proactive basis, first thing in classrooms, a restorative check-in circle, um, before there are issues, kids are less likely to commit these types of offenses. And I'll tell you why. Another circle at another school with some five-year-olds, the question the teacher asked was, if you could be any animal, what would you be? And they're going around, there's a talking piece, and all oh, these kids are jumping around. And then one little girl says, I would be a bird to fly away from my stepfather. The teacher freaks out, looks at me, and I, you continue. Then when you're done, you go to the dean of students and you say, this is what came out. How do we address it? Yada, yada, yada. But right there, you're picking up on something before it gets any worse. And it was an innocent question. So nobody was expecting that. But you're creating a safe space for people to talk. And things come out. And especially with kids. Now, I want to talk about the concentric circle, the first one, the parents. Um, a lot of parents know that their kids have mental problems. And so the next book I'm writing has a, a heavy element of cognitive dissonance in it because they just refuse to believe it. I was missing three students one day. I called them the three musketeers before I retired. So I dialed, sorry, I was missing two of them. One was there. Where are they? Miss, they, let's dial them. It turns out one of their classmates from another class had attempted suicide. They went to his mother and his mother was an attorney in that particular country. And she said, oh, psh, there's nothing wrong with my son. 
you know, that a little vacation won't, I'm going to send him on a vacation. Totally dismissed it. The next week, so she sent him off on five days to some very expensive resort, whatever. And the next week when he came back on campus, he jumped off the roof of the health center. We have got to take some responsibility. We are raising a generation of children who are very, I'm going to use the word weak and then duck if you're going to shoot me, but we're just not giving them what they need. They, they get offended so easily. Suicide rates are going up, um, but they have everything material that they want or don't want sometimes, need or don't need sometimes. We have to take some responsibility for that unless they were born with the iPhone in their hand. And I'm just picking an iPhone because mine's right here. Um, unless they were born with whatever, we gave it to them. And yet we refuse to accept res those kids are so bad. And until we accept some responsibility and actively engage in ways of solving whatever the problem is, because sometimes the problem could be giving them too much of what they want and not need, but we don't see that. We have to reflect. We have to look at behavioral changes. We have to pay attention to our kids' behaviors because all those, all those school shooters um, check to see what race, what age, what income bracket of the parents. Most of them weren't in need. So then what's the problem? Mental health issues that go unaddressed. The parent, I know in one case, the, the, the mother knew and she hid it. So whose responsibility is it? And how does she atone to the mothers of, and fathers of all those kids that he shot? So a, a lot of it has to do with our own um, levels of accountability and our willingness to accept responsibility and engage in a different process. We've got to do something different. And, and the legal fraternity just can't keep locking them up and counting it towards their win-loss ratio because they're coming back out uh, with unaddressed trauma. And in fact, when you put them in there, it gets worse. So if we can capture them, one, before they even commit a crime, so we use restorative processes to unearth some potential bubbling issues and use it on a regular basis. And then we particularly capture them when they first come into contact with the law by addressing their needs and not just locking them up. Uh, then you will see the school to prison pipeline will narrow and eventually be cut off. And I'm not referring to that, we call them the 4%. And then if we have some first time offenders, they will remain just that, first time only offenders, because we're going to address what caused them to commit the crime in the first place. But of course we have to care to do that. Um, we have to have a genuine issue, genuine um, desire to seamlessly reintegrate ex-offenders. And I, I am not convinced that as a society, we were genuine about that which is where the tertiary wrongdoers concentric circle comes in. So let me pause for any questions again. Well, let me ask a question, Dan. There seems to be a, a confluence of things going on in society. And you can hear pundits left and right talk about uh, the social isolation of kids over the last couple of years, uh, everybody staying at home instead of going to school and masking and uh, easy access to guns and easy access to marijuana and other drugs, easy access to alcohol, other big trends in society. And when you say, uh, well, we need to give the kids what they need, treat them differently, somehow have a different approach to it. When there's this overwhelming milieu and society in which we're operating, 
And some of these pundits are just riding their own political hobby horses. And some of these pundits actually have very valuable things to say. But for an individual family or an individual parent who wants to do or an individual school that wants to do things right, where do you start and what do you do? You start by being real and authentic. My daughter likes to tell me, if I say, uh, do you wanna not wear a suit for that interview? I'm going to be authentic. They will hire me as I am or not. But so the parents need to be authentic um, and acknowledge the wrongs in what's going on in, in their household, number one. Uh, as a society, we tend to turn our heads. We know who, the kids are not the ones selling the guns. The kids are not the ones selling the drugs. It's always an adult. So when are we going to hold each other accountable? But parents need to get involved. Um, know what's going on, going on under their roofs and also be visible in the school. A lot of teachers, unfortunately, are there for the paycheck and they are sometimes part of the problem. So the parent needs to be known. Teachers tend to treat children whose parents are visible with a little more respect than kids whose parents never show up. But also be honest, my son has an anger issue. Didn't the mother of the Texas young man say he had an anger issue? Well, if you knew that, then what were you doing about it? Uh, but I want to touch on something you said about isolation. Our kids have been isolated before COVID. They've been isolated a long time ago. They, and we've allowed it to happen. Um, we have not even held them accountable for socializing. Um, we, we have been so caught up in our own survival, in all fairness to some parents, that we, we have relegated them to growing up on their own. And, and I think some parents may not have a choice, but if we, if we live as a community, and I'll give you an example. I went into a particular neighborhood. It was so awful you had to cross over a canal in the kitchen. It was just a really um, folks living in poverty. And some of the young ladies were telling me they wanna get out, but they don't know how to get out. A Couple of them already had kids. And so off the cuff, I said, so if four of you move out and get a one room apartment, Two of you said you can get jobs as security guards, but you have no babysitter. So two of you can stay home. One can dress the kids, one can cook the food, the two can be security guards. Um, how will that work for you? What surprised me is that they hadn't thought of it because in your desperation to get out, surely you would have thought of. But stop thinking individually in, in times of desperation, how can we help each other? So, and yes, it might have to be a one room, but at least you're getting out. What is it you want more to get out um, and to make sure your kids are safe? And they had talked about, they wanted to get out because of molestation and things that they had grown up with they didn't want for their kids. Then four of you get out to work, but of course they say, well, you work and you bring an income and you don't work and that's not important right now. And one of my students is, is in here and she told me there are questions in the chat. Thank you, Latifia. Um, I have found the most success in adopting restorative justice in foreign countries, which I know you don't want to hear, but there's more of a, there's one particular country where they've, I was hired as a consultant to write it into legislation and to work with a, a team to link all the criminal justice, all the arms of the criminal justice system electronically. So you have the courts, 
corrections and police and the added restorative justice and arm. Um, here it's difficult for me and I think it's because the people who could make the change like the system as it was, as it is, and if you think prison industrial complex, maybe that might give you a hint. Um, Suzanne says, were you saying there are primary, secondary, tertiary contributors, offenders too? Yes. And I would argue that we society are the tertiary contributors. So with the, with the victim, the victim's pain goes outward. The family, which is the first concentric, and then the second might be the community, the school, whomever, they feel the pain going out. For the wrongdoer, the influence comes in. Society's dysfunctional behavior impacts the family's dysfunctional behavior, behavior impacts the wrongdoer. So yes, I'm saying that there are primary, secondary, and tertiary wrongdoers, just as there are primary, secondary, and tertiary victims. And Liz says, would you say that there's an increased effort to deal with bullying in the schools would be a good start. So Liz, I have a, I have a thought about bullying. Bullies are not born. And if you think about, if you investigate the bully's background, he or she's either being bullied at home, bullied on the way to, to school, bullied at daycare, something. Because these kids, um, bullies are not born. Now, I've been teaching teachers to deal with bullies differently in the classroom. Um, so, for example, um, the bully, who is no longer the biggest kid in the classroom, which is also a misperception, it's now the tiny little one with the glasses who has learned to manipulate the big one. So that's part of the teacher's issue that they, they, they've stuck on this long held belief. So you call on the child who is bullying. Um, Justin, I need to go to the office. I need you to stand at the door, make sure nobody leaves. Can you clean the board for me every evening? Can you collect the chalk every morning? Can you, Justin, I need you to, this child needs to feel valued, but you also have to address the underlying or root cause of the bullying. So when you have a circle in class, when I do the training, you're trained to do a lesson plan for the circle, depending on the outcome you want. You will craft well-structured questions to elicit information. And then you might find out from Justin exactly why he's bullying. Because if you punish him, send him home, and he's being bullied at home. And listen, there are parents who are bullies, employers who are bullies, siblings who are bullies spouses who are bullies. So you send him home to the bully family and, and then you expect him three, three days out of school suspension. When he comes back, he's worse. So we've got to be real about this. Um, so bullying in school, yes, but you have to ask yourself, how did these kids become bullies? They won't, unless it's a 4% and they were born like that, which it's hardly likely. So somebody is bullying them and they're learning from the inappropriate behavior at home more than likely or an older sibling. So as a teacher, as members of the community, we've got to address the root cause and not just a symptom. The bullying is the symptom of a deeper problem. The bullying itself is not the problem. And any other questions? Diane, what's, how do you define bullying? Is there a concise definition? It depends on if it's the spouse, the boss, the sibling, the parents. It depends. But it's using what used to be brute force, but now it's more mental manipulation and fear to get people to do uh, something you want them to do that will get them in trouble. Something you want to do that will get you in trouble, but you're, you're letting them do it. Um, sometimes you're just in a foul mood, spouse, employer, and you take this foul mood out on your employee or your spouse. Um, 
barking at them to do something that is your responsibility or nobody's responsibility or a lot of it has to do with mood, self-control, um, thought processes, because the bully, so someone could be bullied at work and they come home and bully their spouse. So the, 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 the definition changes. What's happening at work is not what's happening at home, but what's happening at work is causing it to manifest at home. So at work, it's just going to be the employer forcing them to do stuff or you know you can't take lunch or whatever it is, but those terminologies will not apply at home. It will manifest differently. So it's the force, the unwillingness, the mental manipulation, just because. So there's an element of coercion that goes into it? Yes. And that's what would distinguish it from we see we have a whole advertising injury, uh, uh, advertising industry that's based on psychological manipulation to, exactly. get, to buy things you would never think of buying Thank otherwise. You. Thank you. How do you distinguish that? So, so here's here's something, and my student is in here uh, that she's tired hearing me complain about. Is it our fault? Is it the is it the media's fault that we are so gullible? Is it their fault that next, tomorrow they'll say everybody needs to drive a go-kart because it's a sexy thing to do and we all sell our cars and go and buy go Is it their fault we are so gullible? We have to take some responsibility. Now they're wrong. And, and which brings me to another quick topic. When you say media, police, government, big pharma, when you use those terms, you absolve individuals of responsibility because Big Pharma is made up of individual decision makers. But when you use the term Big Pharma, it's a thing, it's not a person. So you're not blaming any one person, but those decision makers all have wives, mothers, sisters, husbands, kids, who should be saying to them, uh, I know you're not part of that, oh no. No, what kind of example are you setting for me? Somebody has to hold them, instead of saying, uh, and I'm gonna use um, one of my students, a student, police officer dating her, he's very corrupt. I said to her, instead of saying, I have tuition to pay and my brother needs one of those stolen cars you're driving, you say to him, if you really love me, you will stop engaging in this corrupt behavior and I, I don't wanna see you until you do. But more than likely you get, I have tuition that's due tomorrow and I need another car and I need a vacation. And so that's us holding each other accountable. So even with big pharma, it's not a machine making the decisions. Corrupt police officers, it's not a machine. It's individuals with mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, cousins, children, who should be able to say, dear, mm -mm. No, I, I can't support you on that there. That, that is wrong. That's wrong. It's not the Martians who will do it. We, we have to hold each other accountable. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Any questions in the last two minutes? I, I have a question. Yes. So we're talking about accountability. Let's imagine the parents of one of these mass shootings, one of these massacres. Do you ever do victim offender reconciliation or mediate between the parents of the shooter because the shooter is no longer available right. for us to have these conversations? Right. And if we take some responsibility in how that person was raised and created and then set loose onto society, do your programs ever have an avenue for the survivors of the wrongdoer and the victims? We do. Here's, here's, here's the, here's a catch. Um, the mother, in the case I'm thinking, has to accept responsibility and oftentimes they don't. Because remember, we have to have the pre-conference interview where the wrongdoer or mother is saying, yes, I was wrong and I'm sorry for what he did, yada, yada. 
or, and then the, the victim's parents have to be in a place where they're past the grief such that they can forgive and want to meet. Oftentimes those two don't sync up. Now, I remember years ago when I was trained, the training module involved the mother of the victim forgiving the wrongdoer and almost adopting him because she found out as a child, he had been chained to a dog cage outside while his parents went to work. And it broke her up and she forgave him and took charge of his life. But if she didn't care enough to dig deep to find out why he did it. Now, somebody might say, I did it because I did it. Well, that's, that's a 4%, as I like to call it. Well, when you dig and you find out, and who treated, them, treated him like that? Us, the adults. But nobody held his parents accountable. And that's, that's just the food for thought I want to leave with you all. Because I know we're at time and we're over by a minute. Any other questions? Sure, Suzanne. <laughs> Would love to. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's fascinating. Thank you all for having me. Thank you to my student, Latifia, for supporting me always to wherever I go in the world. <laughs> Natalie, you want to wrap it up? Uh, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for your program today. So much good stuff to think about. We do like to start on time and end on time. And we always want to encourage anyone who's with us live or watching the video recording, Please be generous with your local food bank. Give what you can. Maybe it's an hour of your time. Maybe it's a dollar. Hopefully it's a little bit more. Uh, but let's support our neighbors and friends who need us. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Jean Lawler. Thank you, Jeff Kitchaven. Thank you, Sari Agamiri. This has been a great program for Will Work for Food, the New Possibilities Hour. Thank you. Mm -hmm.